Behind the Green Door by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2015. Chapter 20 Visitors May we see you alone, Mr. Jasko? requested Ralph Fergus. I don't reckon there's any need for being so all fired private, the old man retorted, his hand on the doorknob. If you want to talk with me, speak your piece right out. I got to hitch up the team. Mr. Fergus and his companion, Harvey Maxwell, glanced coldly towards Penny, who had sunk down into a chair and was massaging her ankle. They were reluctant to reveal their business before her, but there was no other way. "'We can't very well talk with you while you're poised for flight, Mr. Jasko,' Ralph Fergus said placatingly. "'My friend Maxwell has prepared a paper which he would like you to look over. "'I'm not signing anything.' "'Good for you, Grandfather,' Sarah muttered under her breath. The two men pretended not to hear. Mr. Maxwell took a folded document from his pocket and spread it out on the kitchen table. "'Will you just please read this, Mr. Jasko? You'll find our terms are more than generous.' "'I ain't interested in your terms,' he snapped. "'I'm aiming to keep every acre of my land.' "'We're not asking you to sell, only to lease,' Mr. Fergus interposed smoothly. "'Now, we understand that your deal with Mrs. Downey has fallen through.' so there's no reason why you shouldn't lease the ski slopes to us we're prepared to offer you twice the amount she proposed to give you mr jasko stubbornly shook his head you're taking a, a very short-sighted attitude said ralph fergus beginning to lose patience at least read the paper no think what this would mean to your granddaughter interposed harvey maxwell pretty close school in the city perhaps don't listen to them grandfather spoke sarah quickly i have enough clothes and pine top school suits me you're wasting your time and mine said peter jasko i ain't leasing my land to anybody we're only asking you to sign a three-year lease mr fergus argued can't you understand plain language the old man cried you think money will buy everything but you got another guess coming i've seen enough skiing at pine top and i aim to put a stop to it it's no use said harvey maxwell resignedly to his companion ralph fergus picked up the paper and thrust it into his overcoat pocket you're an old fool jasko he muttered don't you dare speak that way to my grandfather sarah cried her eyes stormy you had your nerve coming here anyway after that trick you tried trick you deliberately weaken the brake rod of our bobsled. Ralph Fergus laughed in the girl's face. You're as touched as your grandfather, he said. Perhaps you can explain what became of the top button of your overcoat, suggested Penny, coming to Sarah's support. And don't try to tell us it's at home in your sewing basket. Ralph Fergus's hand groped at the vacant spot on his coat. What does a button have to do with a bobsled accident? inquired harvey maxwell it happens we found a large brown button in the tool house at the downey lodge replied penny also a little additional evidence which rather suggests mr fergus is the one who tampered with the bobsled ridiculous protested the hotel man I i've not even been near mrs downey's lodge in weeks i know that's a lie said peter jasko i saw you going up that way friday night and you went there to damage the bobsled sarah accused you didn't care how many persons might have been injured in an accident ralph fergus's face was an angry red what reason would i have for doing anything like that he demanded guests were being drawn from your hotel because bobsledding was increasing in popularity penny said quietly nothing would please you more than to put mrs downey out of business aren't you drawing rather sweeping conclusions inquired harvey maxwell in an insolent tone a button isn't very certain evidence so many persons wear buttons you know i lost this one for my coat weeks ago added ralph fergus it was your button we found 
Sara accused. Peter Jasko had been listening intently to the argument, taking little part in it. But now, with a quick movement which belied his age, he moved across the kitchen toward the gun rack on the wall. Oh, let's be getting out of here, muttered Harvey Maxwell. He and Ralph Fergus both bolted out the door. Their sudden flight delighted Sarah, who broke into a fit of laughter. Why don't you shoot once or twice into the air, just to give them a good fright? She asked her grandfather. The old man, shotgun in hand, had followed the two men to the door, but he did not shoot. Grandfather wouldn't hurt a flea, really, chuckled Sarah. At least, not unless it was trying to make him sign something. Ralph Fergus acted guilty, all right, declared Penny, bending down to massage her injured ankle. But it may have been a mistake for us to accuse him. I couldn't help it, answered Sarah. When I saw that button missing from his coat, I had to say something about it. Peter Jasko put away his shotgun, turning once more to the door. I'll hitch up the team, he said. Sarah, get some liniment and see what you can do for Miss Parker's ankle. Your ankle? gasped Sarah, staring at Penny. Have you hurt yourself again? I managed to fall into the ravine a few minutes ago. Your grandfather saved me. Sarah darted to the stove to get a pan of warm water. She stripped off Penny's woolen stockings and examined the foot as she soaked it. I suppose this will put me on the shelf for another day or so, Penny observed gloomily. But I'm lucky I didn't break my neck. The ankle is swollen, Sarah said. I'll wrap it with a bandage and that may make it feel better. With a practiced hand, she wound strips of gauze and adhesive tape about the ankle. There, how does it feel now? Much better, said Penny. Thanks a lot. I I feel rather mean to put your grandfather to so much trouble, especially the way I've crossed him. Oh, don't you worry about grandfather, laughed Sarah. He likes you, Penny. He likes me? I could tell by the way he acted tonight. He respects a person who stands up to him. I said some rather unnecessary things, Penny declared regretfully. I was provoked because he wouldn't sign a lease with Mrs. Downey. After hearing what he said to Ferguson Maxwell, I realize nothing will sway him. Sarah sighed as she helped her friend put her shoe on again. I'm afraid not. I'll do what I can to influence him, but I can tell you now he'll never listen to me. Grandfather is just the way he is, and one can't budge him an inch. Peter Jasko soon had the team hitched to the bobsled. He and Sarah helped Penny in, wrapping blankets around her so that she would be snug and warm during the ride up the mountain. Come down again whenever you can, invited Sarah. Only the next time don't try it after dark if you're on skis. Penny glanced at the old man, but his face showed no displeasure. Apparently, he no longer regarded her as an interloper. I'll come as soon as I can, she replied. Peter Jasko clucked to the horses, and the sled moved away from the cabin. Sarah stood in the doorway until it was out of sight. During the slow ride up the mountainside, the old man did not speak. But as they came at last to the Downey Lodge, and he lifted her from the sled, he actually smiled. "'I reckon it won't do any good to lock Sarah up after this,' he said. "'You're both too smart for an old codger like me.' Thank you, Mr. Jasko, answered Penny, her eyes shining. Thank you for everything. The door of the lodge had opened, and Mrs. Downey, a coat thrown over her shoulders, hurried out into the snow. Not wishing to be drawn into a conversation, Jasko leaped back into the sled and with a curt, Good evening, drove away. With Mrs. Downey's help, Penny hobbled into the house and there related her latest misadventure. I declare you'll be in the hospital yet, sighed the woman. I feel tempted to adopt Mr. Jasko's tactics and lock you up in your room. I'll stay there without being locked in, declared Penny. I've had enough skiing to last me until Christmas at least. In the morning, she felt so stiff and battered that she could barely get out of bed. However, her ankle was somewhat better, and when occasion demanded, she could hobble across the room without support. You ought to be all right in a day or so, if only you'll stay off your foot and give it a chance to get well, declared Mrs. Downey. It's hard to sit still, sighed Penny. There are so many things I ought to be doing. 
From the kitchen window, she could see the Fergus Hotel far down in the valley. She was impatient to pay another visit there, although she realized that after the previous evening's encounter with Ralph Fergus and Harvey Maxwell, it would be more difficult than ever to gain admittance. Somehow I must manage to get into room 27 and learn what is going on there, she thought. But how? That is the question. Ever an active, energetic person, Penny became increasingly restless as the day dragged on. During mid-afternoon, observing that Jake had hitched up the team to the sled, she inquired if he were driving down to Pine Top. Yes, I'm sending him after supplies, explained Mrs. Downey. And the newspapers, if there are any. I wish I could go along for the ride. Mrs. Downey regarded Penny skeptically. Oh, I wouldn't get out of the sled, Penny said. Is that a promise? I'll make it one. Nothing less than a fire or an earthquake will get me out. Jake brought the sled to the door and helped the girl into it. The day was cold. Snow fell steadily. Mrs. Downey tucked warm bricks at Penny's feet and wrapped her snugly in woolen blankets. The ride down the mountainside was without a vent. Penny began to regret that she had made the trip, for the weather was more unpleasant than she had anticipated. She burrowed deeper and deeper into the blankets. Jake pulled up at a hitching post in front of Pine Top's grocery store. It won't take me long, he said. Penny climbed down in the bottom of the sled, rearranging her blankets so that only her eyes and forehead were exposed to the cold. She had been sitting there for some minutes when her attention was drawn to a man who was approaching from far down the street. Recognizing him as Ralph Fergus, she watched with interest. At the drug store, he paused. As if by prearrangement, Benny Smith came out of the building. Penny was too far away to hear their exchange of words, but she saw the boy give all of his newspapers to Ralph Fergus. In return, he received a bill, which she guessed might be a fairly high denomination. Probably five dollars, she thought. The boy sells all his papers to Fergus because he can make more that way than by peddling them one by one. And he's paid to keep quiet about it. Penny was not especially surprised to discover that the hotel man was buying up all the papers, for she had suspected he was behind the trick. There's no law against it, she told herself. That's the trouble. Fergus and Maxwell are clever. So far, they've done nothing which could possibly get them into legal trouble. Presently, Jake came out of the grocery store, carrying a large box of supplies which he stowed in the sled. I'll get the papers and then we'll be ready to start. Don't bother, said Penny. There aren't any. I just saw Ralph Fergus buy them all from the boy. Fergus, eh? And he's been putting it out that the papers never caught the plane. It was just another one of his little tricks to make Mrs. Downey's guests dissatisfied. Now we know what he's about. We'll put a stop to it. Yes, agreed Penny. But he'll only think of something new to try. As they started back toward the Downey Lodge, she was quiet, turning over various matters in her mind. Since Mrs. Downey had decided to sell her business, it scarcely seemed a matter what Ralph Fergus did. The sled drew near the Jasco cabin and passed it, turning a bend in the road. Suddenly, Penny thought she heard her name called. Glancing back, she was startled to see Sarah Jasco running after the sled. "'Wait, Jake!' Penny commanded. "'It's Sarah!' Something seems to be wrong. End of chapter 20